Welcome to every one of you who has joined FIC at Home this Palm Sunday. When word on the street was that Jesus was the Messiah, crowds waving branches shouted hosannas to their king and spread out cloaks as a welcome mat for Jesus as he entered Jerusalem. We are here to worship Jesus this morning for all that he has accomplished for us on the cross. Here are some special invitations. First of all, don't miss our BCBC Good Friday service with FIC team leading worship. It will be live streamed from 10 a.m. April the 2nd, and the link will be posted on our website under events. Then on Saturday, April the 3rd, KidZone is hosting an on-site Easter extravaganza from 10 a.m. until noon. It sounds like fun, but this is for kids only, with pony rides, egg hunt, and more of the true meaning of Easter. Register at fichurch.org kids. And April the 4th, for Easter Sunday, invite your friends and your family and your neighbors to join Church at Home for our resurrection service, surprised by Easter. Let's now watch this Palm Sunday scene to focus our worship. The Bible says that as Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, he sent two of them to get a donkey and her colt. This fulfilled the prophecy in Zechariah. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus mounted the donkey and rode into Jerusalem. Many laid their cloaks on the road before him and brought palm branches to wave and celebrate. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. But not all who were there understood him. Some called him only a prophet, believing him wise but denying his divinity. Some raged and cheered for a revolution, hoping he would liberate them from their oppressors. To others, it was nothing more than an interruption. Even as children ran to him and shouted for joy, his enemies wove through the crowd, watching, seething, plotting. The range of reactions was great and wide. Celebration, worship, revolutions, Deception, cynicism, condemnation, boredom, disinterest. But every single person had to confront one thing, who he was. Behold, your king is coming to you. the triumphant entry of our Lord Jesus Christ. And just as the early Christians celebrated with joy and jubilance, would you join with us today? Come on, let's sing together. Great is the Lord. Yeah. 
Deuteronomy 31, 8 says that the Lord goes before you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And church, I, I'm not sure what battle you may be facing today, but the Lord goes before you. He is fighting that battle for you. And we are all facing a battle together as well. And even in this season, Jesus, Jesus is our champion. Amen. So let's sing this song together.
for where you stand undefeated every battle you won and I am who you say I am you crown me with confidence I am seated in the heavenly place undefeated with the one who has conquered it Scripture reading is from the book of Psalm, chapter 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I find no rest. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the one Israel praises. In you, our ancestors put their trust. They trusted and you delivered them. To you, they cried out and were saved. In you, they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delight in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth, I was cast on you. From my mother's womb, you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions that tear their prey open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot shed, and my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircled me. They pierce my hands and my feet. All my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cut lots for my garment. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver me from those sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. From you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts light live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive, posterity will serve him, Future generation will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn. He has done it. Bless the Lord. Bless the reading of the word. Amen. Hey, good morning, church. Glad to be with you today. I'm realizing that we are headed towards the end of our series and the end of the month. This is the second to last sermon in our series on the Gospel of Mark. 
And we're anticipating our, our summer ministry here at the church. And one of the things that uh, we're looking forward to and that we're hoping for and praying for is our nine summer interns this year. And uh, as I was preparing for the sermon, it got me thinking back to my years as a summer intern. I was a, a student, a summer student laborer for the city of Surrey in the roads and drainage department. And uh, it was a great job. It, it really was. Uh, you got to drive big trucks around. You got to learn uh, just new equipment, new gear and things like that. Really enjoyed it. But the first two weeks of every summer with that job was different. The first two weeks, whether it was to, to humble us, you know, we got a, a good paying job at a, at a great place. Maybe it was to humble us or maybe it was to help us get to know the other summer students that were coming in or help us to get to know the city. But the first two weeks were spent picking up litter on the side of the road. So we would walk around as this, this big group of summer students and in one hand you had your black garbage bag and in the other hand you had your litter picker. And you just walked all day picking up any and every piece of trash that you found in your segments of road. And so on this job, you know, we kind of felt like a, a chain gang. You know, you, you're out there with your, your big uh, yellow vest on or your big orange coveralls with a, a big yellow X on it. You're kind of hoping that no one that you knew would see you out there. They'd think maybe you did something wrong and you were being punished by having to go pick up litter. Kind of that feel to it. But in those first two weeks at Summer Students, we spent a lot of time talking. And I ended up spending a lot of time talking to another student, uh, Wes. And Wes and I, we would we'd talk about just about anything and everything to pass the time. School, travel, hopes for the future, uh, tell each other riddles, things like that. Just, just anything to get through that day of, of picking garbage. And one day, we talked about Jesus. And Wes asked a very honest question. And it was a very sincere question. It was one that he had thought through for quite some time. And he meant what he said. He wasn't trying to uh, push or prod me in any way for being a Christian. He just had this honest question. Wes asked, I would die on a cross so that people I love could go to heaven. Why did it have to be Jesus? And as a young 22-year-old, 21-year-old guy, I did not have an answer for Wes. I was stumped. And so as we head into our Easter week, as we head into Good Friday coming up and Easter Sunday coming up, it's good for us to look at what happened at the cross. So let's pray together as we begin our morning, as we begin our study time. Father, we have come into your presence today. We've been worshiping you. Uh, Lord, we want to continue to worship you and get to know who you are and what you've done in an even greater way this morning. And so we ask that you would come and by your Holy Spirit, by the Counselor, would you teach us about the cross this morning? Would you teach us about what happened? Why was it Jesus that had to go to the cross? Would you give us an appreciation for the work what was, that was done, for the gift that was given and has been given to us and that we can receive and for the message that you called us to go out and declare to all people in all nations. So Lord, today, would you come and would you speak into our lives and speak into our minds and hearts so that we can have an understanding and we can be better followers of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I really believe that we begin to get a good and solid appreciation for what happened at the cross by going back into the Garden of Gethsemane. And so if you'd open up in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark again, and it's towards the end of chapter 14. And so uh, Jesus and the disciples have had the Last Supper, and they've had these significant conversations, particularly Jesus with Peter, and now they go up to the Garden. And in the garden, we get to see a side of Jesus that we have not seen up to this point. And I'm so grateful that this is in here because it's only here that we get to see this side of Jesus and this part of his interaction with his heavenly father. And so let's read together, beginning in verse 32 of chapter 14. They went to a place, they went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. 
He took Peter, James, and John along with him and began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and he prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Here in the garden, here with his close set of friends, with those three disciples, Jesus is coming unglued. He is becoming undone. He's coming undone emotionally. And we can, we can see this by the fact that he doesn't take all the disciples up with him. He takes the three guys who have been with him from the beginning, Peter, James, and John. He wants them to be close to him in this hour. He's heading into the worst day of his life. And he just wants a close few to stand watch with him. Jesus has this fear and this apprehension and this deep psychological anguish within him that we get to see in this passage. You can, you can even notice that in, even in verse 35, his body is giving out because of the anguish that he's in. He falls to the ground and cries out to his father. And in his prayer, his, his prayer is to, to Abba, to Daddy, Dad. We get to see that Jesus is, is not stoic in this moment. He's not cool as ice in this moment. He's asking for change. He's asking to avoid death if it can be avoided. He's asking to avoid the pain and the suffering that he's going to go through if it can be avoided. He's not seeking out to go there. And yet at this very hour that he has already talked about with his disciples, that he must go. He knows that he must go. He knows that he must die. And at the very hour, even as he asks that it could pass him by, he says to the Father, not my will, but yours be done. So what is Jesus anticipating here that's bringing out such a strong emotional engagement? What is causing Jesus to, to come undone in many ways? Well, two things are going to happen. Two things are going to happen that he is anticipating within the next 24 hours of his life. The first is, which we know about, the crucifixion. His trials, the torture he's going to go through, and his death. The second thing he's anticipating is that the wrath of God is going to be poured out on Jesus. And so I want to look at these two aspects in greater detail. So let's, let's begin by talking about the experience of the crucifixion for Jesus. Roman crucifixion on the cross, it was reserved for the worst criminals. And so what it was meant to do was by torturing an individual publicly up on the cross, it was meant to dissuade anyone else uh, from the, the populace or community from repeating the same crime. And so what's less known to us is that the cross was actually designed to inflict as much pain as possible for as long as possible while keeping its victim alive for as long as possible. It was by design. And so there are accounts of uh, victims of, of the cross, uh, of people being executed by, by Roman crucifixion where they actually lasted for days up on the cross. And the Romans would actually post a guard at the base of the cross so that the criminal's friends wouldn't just come up and take them down off the cross because you could actually recover uh, from the initial wounds that you received by going up onto one. 
When the Romans wanted a criminal to die, when they figured that criminal had been up on the cross for long enough, that's, what they came, that's when they came and they broke legs uh, so that that man could no longer breathe anymore, or they took a, a spear and put it up through his heart, through his ribcage. And so going into Easter this week, I would like to share with you some of the details of Roman crucifixion to give you an appreciation for what Jesus went through. The first thing that was done by design is that where the nails went through the hand, it's often depicted that the nail went through the palm of the hand, but that wasn't the case because through the palm, the weight of the individual, the, eventually the, the nail would work its way through out towards the end of the hand. Where the Romans put the nail was between the two main bones of the forearm. And so what this did is it gave a support so that the victim could actually hang there for a long time. And it was a strong design for, for the torture because uh, it avoided major arteries and veins up either side so the victim couldn't bleed to death. And right here, right in between those two bones, if you give it a, a pinch, you can feel that. And what that is, it's your major nerve going into your hand. And so when Jesus received those nails through his hands, through this part, it was like fire or like lava or electricity going through his arm and staying there. That's what it felt like. And so we have the pierced hands. Second, we have the feet. Most of the weight, there was uh, the nail that was driven through the middle of the feet. Most of the weight of a man on a cross would rest on those feet. And if a man wanted to take a breath on the cross, he had to push his body up from those anchor points for every single inhalation. And the, the third element to crucifixion is the scourging of the back. Being flogged ahead of time was an act of preparation for further pain on the cross. You see, the, the whip that was used by the Romans had lead tips to it and had chunks of animal bone attached to it. And by design, this would tear chunks of flesh out of the man being flogged and would actually pull the muscles of his back out through the skin. And what would happen when that man went to the cross while Jesus was on the cross, with every breath that he pushed himself up, his back, his lacerated back, would scrape against the splintered surface of the cross. And in this way, it was every second of agony while he was up there. And we can actually see evidence of what he experienced because when you read the words of Jesus, when he is actually on the cross, you'll notice that his sentences are short and his words are few. And that's because he is fighting for every breath and he only has one breath to give words to each time. So back in Gethsemane, part of the grief that Jesus is experiencing is that he knows he is going to suffer physically through this Roman form of torture. But crucifixion is only one part of what his experience will be. It's the human part that we get to see. But Jesus also goes forward into that day to face God's wrath for you and I. Let's read more about it. Let's look at, back at verse 36 together. Jesus says, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. What is the cup that Jesus is talking about? Well, what it is, is it's, it's God's judgment. It's the cup of God's wrath. It's, it's actually talked about in many places in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, in the Psalms. And what it is, is, is this cup symbolizes God's judgment, God's justice, as he confronts human evil in the world, in his world. And so what it is, is it's God's justice and his judgment for human rejection of God, for human idolatry that has gone on and goes on today of human rebellion against God's law, how we're supposed to interact with him and how we're supposed to interact with each other. 
It's human moral corruption on the earth. And it's human injustice. What we do wrong to each other, human to human. And so what I want to do is I actually just want to go back to a few of these passages in the Old Testament that describe God's wrath because it, it paints a bit of a picture for us. And these are the passages that Jesus is referring to when he talks about this cup. Back in Psalm 75, no one from the east or the west or from the desert can exalt themselves. It is God who judges. He brings one down, he exalts another. In the hand of the Lord is a cup full of foaming wine mixed with spices. He pours it out and all the wicked of the earth drink it down to its very dregs. Isaiah 51. Awake, awake, rise up, Jerusalem. You who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath. You who have drained it to its dregs, the goblet that makes people stagger. Jeremiah 25. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me. Take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath, and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. When they drink it, they will stagger and go mad because of the sword I will send among them. So I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations to whom he sent me drink it, Jerusalem and the towns of Judah, its kings and officials, to make them a ruin and an object of horror and scorn, a curse as they are today. And this, this wrath of God, it's directly related to the holiness of God and the love God has for justice. And I'd encourage you, if you, if you want to find out just more about God's holiness and his justice, Psalm 11, read the whole of Psalm 11. It gives you a pretty accurate picture of, of God's pursuit and his love for justice. And it explains his wrath as well. When we talk about God's wrath, you know, we, we maybe get pictures of of the book of Revelation or, or uh, fire and brimstone, that kind of thing. But where I would take us back to, uh, to have just some under, understanding of what God's wrath has looked like already in human history, is actually back to the story of Noah. And in the story of Noah, God destroys life on the earth because of human evil. It's God's wrath that's poured out. And <clears throat> Noah, his family, and uh, the, the animals of the earth who were with him uh, are, are saved, and life continues. But I also remember that at that terrible time when God's wrath was poured out onto humanity, at the end of it, when Noah and his family have come out of the boat, God makes a promise. And his promise is that he will not pour out his wrath and erase human life or life off the face of the earth again in the same way. And we get to see a fulfillment of that promise here with Jesus back in the gospel of Mark because instead of God's, God pouring his wrath out on people, his wrath is going to fall on his son, Jesus. The one who had never sinned became sin in God's eyes. And what this does for us is this, this actually brings us back to that question that my, my fellow student, Wes, asked me that day. A response to, to his statement and question, I would die on the cross so the people I love could go to heaven. Why did it have to be Jesus? The first answer to that is that God has never looked to us as people to be the solution to the problem of sin and evil that separates humans from God. It's very much a human problem. We caused it, we started it, we continue it. We're all part of this web of human sin and evil in the world. It's a human problem, but God has always brought a God solution to it. And he does that with Jesus in a way that you and I could never fulfill. Second, we could never be the perfect sacrifice that Jesus was. He was sinless. And so we, would, we might bring our, our sacrifice saying, here, choose me, I'm, I'm willing to die for the ones that I love. But that sacrifice, just like 
sacrifices in the Old Testament when they were imperfect animals, when they were the runt or they were uh, deformed. They were sacrifices that should be and would be rejected. So our best offer would be rejected by God as inadequate. But where we have imperfection, Jesus came in with perfection. And third is the wrath of God could only be poured onto the Son of God because only the Son of God was given the authority to both lay down his life and then pick it up again, which we see three days later with the empty tomb. So in that garden, Jesus is anticipating drinking that full cup of God's wrath all the way down to the dregs. And you know what? You and I, we will never know the full experience of what that was for him. We'll never know it. And praise God that we will never know what that full experience was for Jesus. Let's go back into the garden and let's continue reading what happens here. From verse 37. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more, he went away and prayed the same thing, that same prayer that we see above there. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning a third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough! The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Something to note here is that when Jesus goes back and prays again, he's praying that original prayer to his Father. Everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. The prayer that he's praying is the prayer that he's taught us. If you go back into the Sermon on the Mount, it's the Lord's Prayer. And so what is very encouraging and refreshing is that we see Jesus as a teacher who walks in what he teaches. He's teaching what he depends on. He's teaching what he does. And so he's praying that prayer in the worst night of his life anticipating the worst day of his life. He's praying that prayer, that same prayer that he taught you and I. So, here at the tail end of this experience in the Garden of Gethsemane, we've got this contrast. There's Jesus who is spending his time uh, just pouring out his emotions to his Father, and we've got, through prayer, and we've got the disciples who are spending that night sleeping. Maybe they're, they're exhausted from ministry leading up to this point in time. Maybe they ate a lot at that Passover feast and they're just having a real hard time keeping their eyes open. There's all kinds of reasons why they might be. But we can see that there's a tension there that Jesus really, really would have preferred if they could have kept watch with him in that moment to be praying with him. But also what we're going to see is the impact of that night of prayer versus that impact of that night without prayer as they all come into a very testing time. With Jesus, there's a real lesson on prayer here for us. The first is he takes his honest feelings and he pours them out to the Father. He takes his honest request, take this cup away, and he pours that out to the Father. And he prays, and what he prays is in submission to the Father, just as he taught us to pray. And so he's not, he's not dishonest, he's not stoic, he doesn't have to put on a show for God or for the Father that uh, here he is very happy to go to the cross. That's not what he's doing, and that's not who he's being. He's, bear, he's bearing his soul to the Father and saying, this is how I feel. He's coming to his Father and he's saying, Dad, I'm troubled, Dad. I'm scared. Dad, not my will, but your will. 
And what we see, too, is that this is not just one moment of prayer. He keeps going back repeatedly, falling on his knees, anguish before God. Same prayer again and again. And he spends his night this way. And the result that we see is that Jesus comes through this night of anguish. This night, this dark night for him. This time when he's been coming undone emotionally, anticipating what he's going to endure. And Jesus is once again calm. He comes out of it cool and collected. And most of all, he comes out of that time of prayer resolved to move forward and move through what God's will is. Through the time of prayer, Jesus, through the time of prayer and because of that time of prayer, Jesus will be and remain resolved. He will remain resolved facing the Sanhedrin. He will remain resolved facing the high priest. He will remain resolved facing King Herod. He will remain resolved facing Pilate and, and the Roman Empire in that moment. He will remain resolved while facing the Roman soldiers who will beat him and mock him, putting that crown of thorns onto his head and striking him with a stick again and again. He will remain resolved facing the agony of the scourging of his back and enduring the cross as he continues to go forward in his Father's will. So there we have Jesus coming out of that significant time of prayer and then in contrast, those disciples, Peter, James, and John, well, their actions, what they will do, is what most humans do. They will take the action that will save their own skins. And we all know Peter's uh, declaration right immediately before the Garden of Gethsemane, where Peter says, even if I have to die with you, Lord, I will never disown you. We remember that one. But there's also James and John. If you go back to chapter 10 of Mark, James and John say something similar. This is after their re request to sit at the right and the left of Jesus. And they say, we can drink the same cup you're going to drink, Jesus. And all of them fail in their commitments. All of them fail in those brave words that they've said when things were going well. And I wonder if it would have gone that way if they had joined Jesus in prayer throughout that night in Gethsemane. I wonder if they would have been strengthened as he was and faced that moment of testing differently. I wonder about that. So now we leave the Garden of Gethsemane and we move forward one chapter to chapter 15 of the Gospel of Mark and we go to the death of Jesus on the cross at verse 33. So let's, let's go there and begin reading together. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And most of you will have a little note in your, in your Bible, maybe a little, little letter behind uh, the final verse there. And if you, if you look up that note, it's a reference back to Psalm 22. And that's the psalm that our scripture reader opened with today. And uh, Psalm 22 is really how God is showing us that he has been sharing his plan for a very long time. He has been revealing his plan for a very long time. Psalm 22 describes this moment exactly. And so... This isn't something new. Jesus dying on the cross wasn't any kind of mistake. This was God's plan, maybe even from the beginning. Let's continue reading together. When some of those standing near heard this, they said, Listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. He said, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion 
who stood there in front of Jesus, the centurion on guard, stood th- st- who stood there in front of Jesus, saw how he died. He said, surely this man was the son of God. Some women who were watching from a distance, some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, the younger and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. It's an interesting note that the disciples, the men had fled, and yet the women are there present at the cross. A couple of things that are really worth noting here. These few verses represent mission accomplished by Jesus. And we, we can see the, the first indication, the first sign of mission accomplished is this tearing of the temple curtain. This was what is thought to be an 80-foot curtain that separated the most holy place where God's presence dwelled from the holy place, the place where uh, the, the priests were allowed to be. And then if you went out of the holy place, well, you, you went into the, the, the temple courtyard where, where the people were. God's presence, his holy presence, had been inaccessible to everyday people up until this point. But at the death of Jesus, God himself takes down that barrier that he had put up. Jesus, his work on the cross, his mission accomplished, allows us to approach God and his presence, his holy presence once more. The second sign of mission accomplished by Jesus are the words of the Roman centurion. This is a a battle-hardened Roman soldier who's come up through the ranks. And his testimony here, and what it shows for us forever going into the future, is that Jesus died not just for his friends, Jesus died for his enemies as well. Jesus died for the very men who executed him. This Roman soldier might even, it's it's potentially true that he might even have been the one that drove the nails into Jesus' hands, into Jesus' feet. He might have participated in the humiliation and torture of Jesus ahead of his execution. Mark, the gospel writer here, is showing us that this Roman centurion, this Roman soldier, he gets what Mark has been declaring throughout his gospel. This man was the son of God. This is Emmanuel. This is God with us. And so coming through this passage, coming through this part of the story of Jesus Christ and his time here on earth, we have a few implications and we have an application for today. Two implications for us. One is that the liberation from sin and death through the death of the Messiah is our reality today. We today are no longer enslaved to sin the way that humanity once was because we are empowered as followers of Jesus Christ. We are empowered by God's Holy Spirit. Another piece of this is that we don't have to face God's wrath. We don't. We don't have to face God's wrath because of that web of human sin that we're a part of. We're not perfect today, but we are empowered in coming out of that slavery to sin. And so what we should do is we should recognize this liberation from sin. We should recognize what Jesus did in taking on the wrath of God for us. We should value this moment. We should treasure it. This freedom we have came at a high price, and we should remember it, and we should recognize it. The second implication for us is a big one. It's a missional one. Because of this moment, because of what Jesus did, we are now ambassadors, ambassadors of God out in the world. Let's go over to 2 Corinthians really quick here as we wrap up. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 18-21. This is one of the implications for us. 
Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's an exciting thing. And finally, we have the application. I would say that a, a strong application of this passage of the garden and of the death of Jesus is that we can express our feelings, our, our honest feelings to God. Our Lord did that. In the dark night of, of our soul, our nights that are filled with fear of apprehension and anguish, we can pour ourselves out in prayer before our Father. It's appropriate to do because our Lord did it. I'm so glad we got to see that side to Jesus. Whether it's a, a loss of health or a loss of life, we have many dark times in our human experience where we become unglued and undone as well. It's that loss of security or job or relationship. It's the, the hopelessness that we sometimes get into and feel in certain seasons of our life, a hopelessness for the future. It's when our life is not the way that we would have it. And it can potentially be when God calls us to be, obey in something that is difficult. It's, it's hard for us to step into. We can pour ourselves out to our Father or, as well. It's okay to be broken before God. In fact, it might even be good to be broken before God, to pour out our emotions to him, because guess what? He's our father now too. It's okay for us to come into his presence now. The curtain is torn, and we come into his presence as adopted children of God, and we say, Dad, I'm troubled. Dad, I'm scared. Dad, please take this thing away that's in my life. But dad, your will be done in my life. When we face desperate times, we want to respond with those desperate prayers. Better to spend a night in prayer than to spend a night only in worry and in restless sleep. Better to spend a night in prayer. We fail under our own power. It's important to recognize that. It happened to the disciples. We can identify with them. We can't live out the oaths that we make, how we, how we hope we might live in certain moments. We need to pray to receive God's empowerment and to move through those dark days and dark seasons that we experience. So that's, that's where I would encourage you to apply that passage of Gethsemane. Pray. Pray into dark seasons and dark times. Pray through them. And I believe you will come out the other side, resolved to move forward as Jesus was empowered by God. And so I can't think of a, a more appropriate way to close our, our time together than by praying the Lord's Prayer. Would you pray at home? Would you pray the Lord's Prayer with me? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and as we have forgiven them. And Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. Bless you today.
thank you for worshiping with us this Palm Sunday and for your gifts given online. Jesus entered Jerusalem with shouts of Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. It's a word that means save us, save us, save us. Within days of that parade, Jesus was arrested, spit on, flogged, and a crown of thorns pressed deep into his scalp. Seeing him in this condition, the crowds chanted, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. So in one breath, they say, save us, and in the next breath, crucify him. What they didn't know is that they couldn't have this one without this one. In order for them to be saved, Jesus had to be crucified. I pray that today you have been led to a deeper appreciation of the crucified Christ and will look to Jesus, the faultless Lamb of God who died in our place, rose alive for you to live, forgiven and free. To him be glory now and forever. Amen.